And uh, last week, after going through the churches in chapter 4, uh, verse 1, are you there? Now, please remember that John wrote the book of Revelation 65 years uh, after the Lord uh, was crucified and resurrected. So he's an old, old man, way up in his 90s. And uh, I don't know, I, I'm not 90 yet, but uh, I went on in writing everything that they see just like a letter. Uh, being 90-some years old, I'm sure it took him some time to write a little bit here, a little bit there. But uh, he evidently had a good memory because he wrote everything he's seen. And uh, <clears throat> his, uh, the, the key that we've been using, the golden key I call it, is... Uh, uh, Revelations 1 and 19, uh, Jesus told him to write the things that you have seen, the things that are, and the things that will be. And uh, John, having <clears throat> been an apostle of the Lord, uh, he had a lot of things that he had seen uh, in wa walking with the Lord. And, of course, he wrote John and uh, 1 and 2 of the letters of John, and then he wrote this, and I'll tell you, with that, that's a full-time ministry to have written either a tremendous uh, uh, memory. Uh, of course, we know that the uh, Holy Spirit helped him write them. So <clears throat> in verse number 1, let's uh, read, or in chapter 4, let's read verse 1. After this, after what? After he had seen the revelation of Jesus, saw his glory, been in his presence, saw the uh, lampstands, saw the stars in his hands, saw how he looked in the office of high priest, the beautiful garments, the white hair, and all of that. After he had beheld that, he said, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Now, when we go through the uh, other <clears throat> 18 chapters of this, you're going to find that John is talking. Uh, sometimes he's talking to an angel. Sometimes he's talking in what he sees, and he's writing it down. So uh, he had uh, a, a tremendous memory, but also he had a tremendous anointing and a revelation that was given unto him. So he said, after this I looked. And uh, what he had seen before was the admonition of the church. The Lord being very specific about what each church, there was seven of them at that particular time, uh, what each church had failed in. And just to give you an example, the first one he mentioned was Ephesus. And Ephesus uh, was the most spiritual church of that time. Uh, it was a church that Paul had founded uh, in Ephesus, and uh, he used that pretty much in his latter days before he went to prison as a, uh, a residence. He had uh, a place at the local, uh, oh, what do you call it, not a college, but, uh, well, we'll call it a place of learning uh, that was in that city, and he used it to train uh, young preachers. And so it was a, a very spiritual church. And what Jesus found wrong with that church was not immorality. Uh, it was not thievery. It wasn't murder or anything like that. He just said, I have somewhat against you that you have left your first love. And uh, I wonder if while we're in attendance here tonight, if the Lord came in and got our attention and uh, said, I have something to say to you, we'd all be scared to death. But I wonder what he would chide us for. I wonder what he would put his finger on. Have we lost our first love? Uh, have we lost our fellowship with him? Uh, have we uh, maintained a link of prayer constantly in communion with him? Uh, have we left off our dedication, our commitment, our faithfulness to him as well as to others? And uh, the only church that he really couldn't find anything wrong with uh, was of Philadelphia. The rest of them, some uh, was drastically wrong. Others was just like uh, Ephesus. They'd lost their first love. And uh, I think when we remember, how many of you remember the night you got saved? 
you, you was a completely different person, and uh, I'll guarantee you that you bubbled with joy the next day, singing, making melody in your heart unto the Lord, whistling or whatever you done. Uh, you was just filled with the joy of the Lord, and uh, you were also filled with the love of God. You loved everybody. And you wanted to tell everyone what great things the Lord had done for you, but especially you loved God and His people. And that being the case, you wanted to be in His presence, and you wanted to be with His people. And uh, I hope we don't ever lose that uh, to the full extent. I know uh, we have probably drained down a little bit and need our vessel refilled up uh, with the love of God. And uh, in the cares of life and things of that nature, uh, that can happen. And just let me give you an illustration. You go into a town on Sunday morning, and you have a, a beautiful cathedral sitting there. It can be any denomination you want to put the name on. Uh, but you look at that, and you know that that cathedral costs upwards of thousands of dollars. And in this day and age, maybe over a million. And uh, it's beautiful. It's probably a real beautiful inside, and you see maybe four or five cars in the parking lot. What does that say? They've lost their first love. They don't have the attendance record they used to have. They don't have the dedication of getting to the house of the Lord, and uh, because of that, uh, they're not in evangelism. They're not uh, caring about other people's problems and, and such a things of that situation. So if the Lord told us today, uh, I have somewhat against you, you've lost your first love, uh, that would be a, well, that would be a terrible uh, sentence for him to put on us, really. And uh, it would be uh, a lot better uh, than saying that we, uh, uh, we have the synagogue of Satan here in our midst and uh, we have witchcraft and things of that nature. But uh, just to lose our first love would be a, a terrible indictment against us. So he told John, write these things, that which you have seen, the church formation, the experience, that which are, the present tense that he was uh, given unto him, and uh, that which will be in the near future. And this has been our key in uh, Revelations 1.19 all the way through. So John had seen the glorified Christ. Uh, he had been on the Mount of Resurrection with him, or transformation. And uh, he had beheld him uh, heal the sick and, and cleanse lepers and raise dead and uh, just pour himself out to people. So he had that. Uh, in his heart that he wanted to write. He had also seen in his present time the condition of the church, and then he had seen, as Jesus told him, those things which will be and the things coming. And out of these three, John has written a message. And to every one of these seven churches, how many of you went home and read any of them? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> that's good because it's good for you to read over what we talk about tonight. And at the end of every one of those uh, churches, uh, Jesus said, He that hath an ear, let him hear. And this is what he would say to us. He'd give us uh, whatever he thought we were slack on, and he that hath an ear, let him hear. Let him hear what? What I'm saying to that particular church. And after that, uh, after he mentioned that seven times, which is the number of fulfillment, and we go through about uh, seven chapters in Revelations, over to Revelations 13, 9, he has changed his phrase. It's no longer he that hath an ear, let him hear. It's he or if any man have an ear. And, of course, when we get over there, it's going to be a, a whole different ball game. Uh, because a lot of things have taken place, and uh, there's trials, there's tribulations, there's tri troubles, there's tribulation, and things of that nature. And there will be Christians here going through that. So we're going to do tonight just to take a look inside of heaven, and I've got the things up there that John has seen, and uh, it's more of a story or an outline or even a vision, if you want to call it, of symbols more than it is anything else. Remember when I started, I made it very plain to you that Revelation is a book of what? Symbols 
and numbers. And every, every number has a meaning. There's going to be numbers in this tonight. Also, every symbol has a meaning. And the way that you can find out 99 times out of uh, 100 is the symbol that you see look somewhere in Scripture and you'll find that vision again. Now, uh, if, when you look into uh, chapter 4 and you go through all the things that's written there, these same things is recorded in detail in another book in the Bible. Every prophecy that God gives has a witness. No prophecy is without private interpretation. When God says something, if He says something through by Isaiah, somewhere in the Word there's going to be a witness to that. Another prophet is going to have the same prophecy. Uh, this is why that the book is so so perfect uh, that God never allows Himself to be without a witness. And when He gives a prophecy uh, to a prophet, uh, it's going to be somewhere else for two reasons. Number one, to confirm the Word of God that is given, and also to confirm the authenticity of the Word given by a certain prophet. And uh, if, you can, if you can remember that, anything that you see. Now, tonight what we're going to cover, and I'm not going to read the whole thing and cover the things, but God, i got them all up here. But this vision that God gave unto John is all recorded in Ezekiel, first chapter, 1 through 10. So here you have two witnesses that have seen the same thing, recorded the same thing, and the meaning and the purpose of it is the same thing. And it's looking into the realm of heaven. And uh, as we look into the realm of heaven, uh, we're going to see things that is mentioned there. And the fourth chapter is more in preparation for the Son of God coming home than it is in anything else. And uh, as we go through this, number one, you're going to see an open door. And it's symbolic of our welcome to the throne. Anytime we have visitation rites with God. Now, before the crucifixion of the Lord and the shedding of the blood, we could not come into the presence of the Lord. Only the priesthood could. And we had to rely on the high priest uh, bearing our sins before the Lord for our forgiveness, never having the privilege of talking to him unless he has specifically called us and appointed us as a prophet. Now, wouldn't that be a terrible state of affairs to live in if you couldn't pray and couldn't go into the throne room of God? Because we were sinners. We were unworthy. But when Jesus came and shed his blood and paid for our penalty, took away the condemnation of guilt and shame, and also took away the curse that was against us, God said, the soul that sinneth, it shall, S-H-A-L-L, -L, not maybe, it shall die. And we were all guilty, the Bible says, under the law. We had all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when Jesus paid for our our uh, uh, sinful took the blood and put it on the mercy seat of heaven. God looked at it and said, I am satisfied. And we were justified, and we're still justified by faith in that blood. So <clears throat> we see an open door, which is symbolic uh, of our welcome to the throne any time we have visitation rites. Number two, we see that uh, activity is there, and it's primary worship. And when I get to the end of this, all you worship leaders, I want to encourage your hearts, because uh, you see a plan, and you see in detail what takes place in heaven, and I want you to think about that when you plan worship and praise here. <clears throat> we have worship, and it's a primary activity there. Then we have the throne. And the throne is mentioned 12 times in just this one chapter. It is the ultimate authority. God sits on the throne. We have perfect liberty and freedom to come and kneel at that throne any time. And we will find peace. We will find contentment. We will find joy at the foot of the throne of the Almighty God. We, we can't even begin to conceive up here the rights and the privileges 
that God has given us through the blood. That we, uh, to think of it, you can wake up at night. And uh, for some of us, we wake up and it's kind of hard to get back to sleep. And we can begin to praise the Lord. Uh, he might bring things to your remembrance for you to pray for. And even in the hours, the wee hours of the morning, you've always got God's attention if you come through the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I can go, I can go to Washington, D.C. I wouldn't. But I can go to Washington, D.C. and sit out on front of the steps of, of the White House for a year and never be invited in. But all I got to do is just say, Hallelujah! Glory, glory, glory! And you've got His attention. And you praise Him. You worship Him. Uh, you make your petitions known with thanksgiving. We cast all your care upon Him, whatever the case might be. So we have everything revolves around the throne. Uh, Isaiah saw it in Isaiah 6. Ezekiel saw it and all of those uh, living creatures that was around it in Ezekiel 1. And out of this throne proceeds thunder. Lightning speaks of grace. And uh, what always follows thunder? Lightning. So when God thunders with judgment, grace automatically follows. So we are continually free from judgment if we walk upright before the Lord. There's therefore now no condemnation to buddy. Right? Amen? Because uh, the condemnation has been taken away. We walk in the Spirit and we fulfill the law of grace. And then we see... God Himself sitting on the throne. And we have the description of Him. We see that what comes forth in this, uh, uh, well, demonstration or just actual uh, picture of Him, He has on the Sardis stone. Now, you may say, well, what's so important about the Sardis stone? When God gave the high priest a breastplate of gold and precious linen, on that breastplate was 12 stones. Each one of those stones had the name of one of the 12 tribes on it. And the first stone that was in there was a Sardis stone. And it was bright red, as red as you can get. I've never seen one, but it, the Sardis stone is red. And that was Alpha. The Jasper, which was the last stone on the breastplate, is Claire. And it's the Omega. Now what does God say He is? The first and the last. And He's everything in between. So you have number one that stands out is a Sardis stone, which is red. And we come into His presence through the blood of Jesus, which is pure red. And when we're there, thank God, we're there under the jasper and it is perfectly clear. It is transparent. God can look through that and see us, and there's no sin. There's nothing, because the Alpha Stone, which is red, has given us free passage, and altogether, uh, uh, clear, and there's nothing there. Then there's a rainbow, and it surrounds the throne. It's complete circle. It's, it's eternity. There's no beginning. There's no ending in God. And there's no beginning and there's no uh, ending in God's covenant keeping word. It is all one great big story. Beginning at Genesis 1 to Revelations 22. It is complete. There's no failure in it. You may meet agnostics and they might have a scripture and try to lead you off on a dirt road and they do that with just one scripture. And this is why I say it's so important to you to have more than one scripture, more than one prophecy because they all chain together in a golden chain of truth. And if you will do that, uh, they can't deceive you. And God's word is a covenant. Genesis 9, 13, uh, you will find that at 6 through 13. All right, the next was the emerald, which is green. And around this throne, you'll see living creatures. And that is what green represents. It re represents the greenness of the earth. It represents life. 
And these are all here. You say, well, why is this so important? Because what you see here is there for a purpose. And we're going to touch on that in just a moment. So <clears throat> the creation, uh, Romans 8, I think it's, help me out, Wilma, I think it's 28 or 30, says that all creation, huh? 19, all creation is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, they were under a curse. And in the fifth chapter, when we get there next week, we'll talk more about that. But all creation was under a curse when Adam sinned. Adam tilled and worked the garden. Uh, God had given him control over everything that he had made. He even allowed him to name the animals. And everything was put there for his pleasure, but also for his privilege of keeping it for the Lord. But when he sinned, sin came in, and death by sin, Romans says. And he lost his place, he was put out of the garden, and because of that, God said, from henceforth, the earth will produce thorns for your sake. Up till that, it was a living garden of beautiful vegetation. But after he sinned and transgressed, he was put out. And from that time on, the earth, as well as man, has been under a curse. And the only way we get out from under that curse is to come to Jesus, be forgiven, our sins forgotten, and we're no longer under the curse, we're under the blessings of God. Hallelujah! How I many is awake out there? Okay. Then we have the elders. And uh, here's where we're going to get into what is good. These elders represent David's tabernacle and Solomon's temple and the degree of worship. Now, when how many of you read the Old Testament? And I won't have to spend a lot of time. Okay, you remember the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant. That was Israel's sacred gift of God. It represented the presence of God. God's Spirit dwelt over the cherubim and over the mercy seat. And uh, Israel, by forfeiture of uh, disobedience and everything else, and a priesthood that was foul and corrupt, they lost that, and it went to the Philistines for several years. And uh, while it was there, God put a curse on the Philistines. They had to uh, The young died premature. Uh, people had boils and cancers and everything else. And uh, they finally found out, hey, we didn't have this before we had that, that ark here. And the ark was the problem. The ark itself didn't give them those diseases, but the judgment of God was giving those people those diseases. So David went to the Philistines and asked for the ark, and they obliged him, he's willing to get rid of it, and brought it back. And there were some things that happened in the meantime, but we'll jump over them, and we'll come to the place where David took that ark and set it on Mount Zion. And he put a tent over it. And it was uh, called David's Tabernacle. And he worked out by, I imagine, I know he got the directions from God on the Solomon's Temple. I'm sure he did here. And he set up worship and praise because they were a special nation. No nation could stand before them when they walked under the covenant of God. And the glory of the Lord was upon that mercy seat still. And so he put it in a tent on Mount Zion, and it was called David's, David's Tabernacle, and he instituted worship continually. Now, the temple, or the uh, original tabernacle, was down at Shiloh. And they were still offering sacrifices of bulls and bullocks and doves and all of that. The priesthood was operating down there. But God's presence was up here on the mercy seat, where it has always been and always will be, because that's a type of Christ. So uh, David degrees and how they would operate. And then when David wanted to build Solomon's temple, what we call Solomon's temple, uh, Solomon built it, but David had the blueprint. 
David wanted to build it, but God said, No, you're a man of war. You've shed too much blood. I will have your son built it. But David had the blueprints, and uh, Solomon built according to the blueprints. So we're going to touch on that a moment, but let me get the rest of this. Out of the throne, as they saw God sitting on the throne, in this vision here in the fourth chapter, uh, there's a sea of glass, and that is transparency. Uh, glass, you can see through it, pure glass. And uh, Paul said that we look through a glass now darkly. We don't see beyond the realm of ourselves. We don't see into the realm of the Spirit. But he's saying that when that which is perfect has come, the veil will be pulled away, and there will be no more looking through dimness and darkness. We'll be looking through clear glass. And uh, this is what the uh, transparency in the sea of glass speaks of. Uh, all the mysteries of God will be revealed. Uh, we'll behold the glory of God and Christ our Redeemer, and we will know as we are known, and all things will be completely pure and without mystery whatsoever. Okay, I want to come now to the title up here, Homecoming of the Son. Uh, how many people we've got here that uh, come through the World War II era? Oh, man, I got a bunch of old geezers here. Now. <laughs> well, I did too. <clears throat> I, had, uh, I had three brothers and an adopted brother in the Army. We had four. And uh, I can remember uh, they, they wouldn't know, or if they did, they couldn't write a letter home and say, I'll be there December 25th, uh, because they were, everything was censored. And uh, the reason for that, my brother's out on a ship, uh, if that mail got lost and it fell into the hands of the enemy, they would know that ship was on its way to its home port and submarine would meet it somewhere along the way. And we would get letters from those guys and they'd just be cut to ribbons by the censors. And you'd have to try to figure out what they were talking about. So uh, sometimes uh, the ship would come into San Francisco uh, for work uh, I'm glad it didn't go to the South Pacific because somebody was working there and it wouldn't have been seaworthy after they left. <laughs> it should the South Pacific work? Yeah, I thought so. That's why we had so many sunk there. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, they had a home port and some, uh, it might be San Diego, San Pedro, or San Francisco, and when they would land, they'd get... Uh, a shore leave for such a time, maybe 10 days, two weeks, whatever it took to get that ship equipped and back to sea again. And they would call home and one at a time, none of them ever come at the same time. One came and the day we took him, put him on the bus, my other brother came in on the bus. But uh, they would call and say, I'll be home tomorrow or the next day. And immediately, my mom started preparation for that individual. Now, she knew what he liked. She knew the kind of dessert, the kind of cake, his favorite pie, uh, the favorite meal, and uh, she set herself to preparation for that. And <clears throat> this is what uh, God has done for the homecoming of his son. And I, I want to... Uh, I want to deal now with just this, uh, this homecoming worship. See, Jesus in this chapter is not home. He comes home in the fifth chapter. But all preparation here is getting ready for his homecoming. Now, think about this in the mind of God. I'll have a little bit more time. God has given his most precious gift. He came to this earth as a baby. The one that had made everything that you see out there. You go out tonight, if it was a clear night, you'd see stars, you'd see Jupiter, uh, you would see Venus, you'd see the moon, and you'd see stars that you and I don't even know the name of them. Who made those? Jesus. He made everything that was made, was made by Him, and for Him, and without Him, nothing exists. Uh, blessed, raised dead people, blind eyes opened at His touch, 
lepers was cleansed at his touch. And he, he was so outstanding that the people of the day couldn't comprehend him and couldn't receive him by the fact that he was the Son of God. He looked just like anybody else. But he had God on the inside. And everywhere he went, he was a blessing. And instead of receiving him, they cursed him. They beat him. They whipped him. They stripped him. They crucified him and hung him on a cross and let him hang there till life ebbed out of him. Then took him and put him in a borrowed grave. Now that's the price that God paid for you and me. And if it had just been one, he would have still done it. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. After three days, he was resurrected. But during that three days, and this is what you don't hear preached very much, he wasn't in that tomb dead. He was alive. He descended into the depths of hell. He battled satanic forces. He stripped the devil of all of his power. The Bible said, and Jesus, this is his very words, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of hell, death, and the grave. But he didn't have them up until that time. And we're going to deal with that next week. So put on your crash helmet. But in just a few days, he will be resurrected. And when he's resurrected, Peter said he led captivity captive. What was captive in the bowels of the earth? The Old Testament saints. Read the 16th chapter of Luke, and you will find the story of uh, the rich man. And what's the other guy's name? Lazarus. Not Lazarus. Yeah, the rich man and Lazarus. And the La- Lazarus is wanting a drink of water. And he wants Abraham to give it to him. And Abraham says, Son, remember when you had everything? He's talking to the rich man. Lazarus is, is there, but he's in the other place. And he asked Abraham to send Lazarus. So just, but Abraham said, No, there's a gulf fixed between you and between us. Then Matthew, when Jesus was resurrected, Matthew points out that many Old Testament saints were seen walking on the streets of Jerusalem. They was resurrected with Jesus' resurrection. And now he transports them to glory. He didn't leave them in paradise. He takes them to glory. And David gives us a picture of this whenever the Lord cries out, uh, how does that go? Lift up your head, O ye gates, open wide your everlasting doors, the King of glory will come in. And the angel says, who is this King of glory? And Jesus said, the Lord God of the hosts, the Lord God Almighty. And he took the Old Testament saints in. Okay, God is waiting for him to come home in chapter 4. All, uh, all uh, everything that can be done has been done. And God is honoring here the tabernacle of David and Solomon's temple. Listen to what he does. He has the temple priests. The trumpets, the cymbals. Now, they're not there, but he has others playing the same way that he had them playing in uh, the tabernacle of David and Solomon's temple. The musicians were the temple priests, the tribe of Levi. They played with trumpets. They played with cymbals. They flutes. And the Bible said the instruments that David made. Can you imagine a shepherd boy having enough wisdom To make all those things? Then 
Can I go on? I'm talking about a worship service, brother, that will rock the foundations of a church. Then they had the special vocalists. They were the 24 sons that you see there. You call them 24 elders. The 24 sons of the second degree. Now, I don't know what the first degree is. I couldn't find it. But these were the 24 sons of the second degree that we had in the uh, Solomon's Temple. Then he had the worship leaders, 288, no shortage there, and they had a small choir, 4,000 members in the choir. Now, I want to go over this again. We've got Mount Zion, we've got a tent set up, and we've got the Ark of the Covenant in there. And then the same program is carried on at the dedication of the temple that Solomon made. And David wrote the blueprint. The temple priests, trumpets, cymbals, harps, flutes, the special vocalists, 24 sons of the second degree, worship leaders, 288 and a choir of 4,000, and they began to play, they began to sing, and the Bible said that the earth vibrated. And the glory of God filled the temple. Now, that was Solomon's temple. But here you see the same pattern setting up here. God has all of these... Uh, well, what do you call them? Uh, they're, they're, they're representative of the animal kingdom, the man kingdom, and the fowl kingdom. They're all there because the one that created them is coming home. What a time, what a time, what a time. And when he gets home, we're going to look at that next week. And we're going to see what he done when he come home. Uh, it, it, it just goes a little bit beyond a comprehension of the things that God has done. And uh, can, you, can you imagine uh, all, the, uh, all the noise that took place there? If it made the earth vibrate, can you imagine how loud that was? But you know God is considerate of every individual. God is kind and God is merciful. And when we see this and realize this is going to be an everyday occasion in heaven. But God is going to do something very special for those people that can't stand noise. He's going to have 30 minutes of silence. And you can enjoy that 30 minutes and when that 30 minutes is up, get out of the way because <laughs> we're going to have church. And it's going, to be, it's going to be outstanding and wonderful. Ronnie, how would it be to have a choir of 4,000 people, 288 worship leaders, cupbearers helping you, and all kinds of flutes, trumpets, cymbals, and everything else. And they were there for one purpose, and that was to glorify God. They're being set in place here in the chapter 4 of glorifying the Son of God when He comes home. You talk about a homecoming, brother. Now, that sounds wonderful and that sounds great. But stop and think of this. You ain't seen nothing yet compared to the homecoming we're going to have. It was wonderful because Jesus was God's own son. And he was just one. But you and I have become sons of God. We have been made to be sons of God. We are his family. And he loves us just as much as he loved Jesus. If we live for him, walk for him, and serve him, 
He loves us because He loves everybody with the same love. And the reason He does is because the Bible said the love of God is shed in our, abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is no respecter of persons. Charlie, I know it's hard to conceive, but God loves you as much as He loves me. And I just can't figure that one out. But He does. And when, when Jesus came home, and he, he had this tremendous welcome for Him, what do you think He's going to do when millions come home? Ronnie, come on. God bless you. Thank you for your attention tonight. I appreciate it so much. Okay, brother. That's all there is for then. Read it for me. Well, I'm going to read it for me. Okay, Jesus is now presently sitting in the Father's throne at his right hand. Stephen saw this, uh, the fourth or fifth chapter of Acts. But the time is coming in the 21st and 22nd chapter that Jesus will not be sitting with his Father. Jesus is going to have a wife, and she will be sitting in the throne with him. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's you and me, brother. He that overcometh will I allow to sit with me in my throne. Right now, it's the Father's throne, and Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father on high. But in one of these church, in one of these uh, letters, he says that we will sit with him in his throne. Revelations, we are put with him as the bride. You got that verse? We are with him as his bride, and we're sitting with him. And I believe it's the 17th chapter. Maybe it's the 13th chapter. Uh, speaking of the, there's 144,000 that are sealed. And then it goes on to talk about something else. And John said, and these are they that follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. Now, I've got a wife that loves me enough that she wants to go everywhere I go. I can't even go golf without her. Because we're, we're, we're united. And we're going to be that way with Jesus. Yep. That's right. There's one body of Christ. There's one baptism in the Holy Spirit. There's a baptism in water. But there's also one baptism in the Spirit. God is a spirit. Uh, well, that's all right. That's what that's what Bible studies for. I don't know if they had the tape turned off back there or not, but <laughs> if not, we got your voice. Thank you, folks. God bless you. <clears throat>